Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fun and Games Podcast. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I'm Matt A.K. Stormageddon. And you're listening to episode 87. And this episode, Matt and I wanted to talk a little bit about getting back into games. Not just games in general, but we all have lapses in playthroughs of games. Maybe we had a bit of a challenge before a boss and never came back, or life just gets in the way. But when you try to get back into a game after being away from it for a day, a week, a year, a decade, and what do what do games provide for us to get back into that experience? Yeah, uh, the resources are actually pretty limited in easing you back into a playthrough from a time away. I find that most games that if I'm away from them for more than six months, I just start over. It actually happened recently uh, with the Witcher series, which I've been posting about on the Discord server. Um, The first and second game were on sale on Steam for like five bucks. So I bought them. Um, I played the first game and then promptly stopped playing it because it's terrible and watched a recap video instead. And then I played the second game and having played both these games, this was brought on by watching the the Netflix series and having owned the third game for a while. When the third game first came out, um, I got it as a gift from my spouse and I started playing it immediately and fell in love with it. Um, but it's such a massive game that I couldn't get, like eventually I just burned out or I got distracted or, you know, the usual with large games yeah, like that. Absolutely. And, And so then I I stopped playing it and I never went back to it. And I loved the Netflix series so much, warts and all. I know it's not a perfect series. Um, We will discuss it, I'm sure, at some point on the podcast. Um, But once I finished it, I was like, oh, now I really want to play these games. Like, I love these characters. I want to see more. And so after playing the second game and loving it so much, I'm like, all right, let me revisit the third game, which I haven't played in a while. But like, I booted up my old save and I like it shows you what quests you have but i couldn't remember where i was in the story i couldn't remember what choices i had made and so i was like um and witcher comes close to mass effect and like the effects of your choices change the course of the game and ripple over into the following games and so i was like all right i guess i'll start over because there were no real tools to catch me up like there is a a brief narrative catch up when you load up the game where um the voice actor of your mentor um but it's not actually his character doing the VO, which is a little weird. Gives you like a brief re- recap of the chapter you're in, but it doesn't give you a full recap of like what you've done to that point. So I was so lost, it just made more sense to start over. And even when I was playing through the game, which I have now completed, uh, I'll use that term loosely. I finished. I don't. I didn't necessarily complete a hundred. You saw the credits. Game. Yeah, exactly. Um, I rolled the credits on it. There were several times playing through it where I was like, oh, this is where I left off. And then I would do a few things that I didn't remember doing and going, oh, maybe, maybe that's not where I left off. Oh, no, this is where I left off. And like it it got me to thinking, you know, especially during the time of quarantine we're currently living in, although by the time this episode airs, who knows, maybe a miracle happened. Uh, Uh. (laughs) That there was no real way to jump in. And a lot of games that I've left to the wayside because I lost interest, I got distracted, a new game came out. I hesitate to go back to because I either can't recall the story, I can't recall the mechanics, or both. Like, it's why I gave up on Horizon Zero Dawn, which I liked because I got burned out on it. I got distracted by some new shiny game. And then by the time I tried to go back to it, I was like, what am I doing? Where am I? Just games, modern games don't seem to really give any kind of support for you jumping back into a game. And if and if the game is overly complicated, it's harder to jump back in. I feel like I could jump back into Shovel Knight halfway through much easier because it's literally pick a stage, keep playing. But something with a large world and a narrative, like it's very easy to get lost. Yeah. Well, even uh, as an example of Shovel Knight, there's that is a game where you can go back to a previous level as well. You yeah. can, you know, it's it's sort of a ramp back the challenge a little bit if you want to get back into it. And yeah, it, it does seem like at best what we get for diving back into a game is a little bit of a narrative catch up. Like I was, I was trying to figure out like, all right, you know, what, which games kind of help you ease back in. I, I, I remember like previous Pokemon titles and I'm pretty sure still to this day, but I, I certainly remember, uh, when I was getting back into it, being delighted that, you know, whether it was an hour or however long since you saved and turned off the game, you come back on, it almost gives you like journal entries, yeah. like did this, saw this, had that happen. It's like, Okay, yeah, I'm at that point in the story. I'm at that point in whatever. But Pokemon's 
fairly straightforward. Not a big deal. You know, I remember the original Metal Gear Solid did the same kind of thing. It had, I feel like it had sort of a predetermined, like, storybook thing to it that whenever you saved it, just like, okay, here's the previous two pages. Cool. But those are more linear experiences. Nowadays, as you pointed out, that the the systems are so much more complicated. It's not just the idea of where am I in the story? What is my quest? Though that is helpful. I mean, we need those when we're actively playing the game. Like, what are the 12 things that I agreed to do across four towns over the last three hours? We, we need to check that stuff. So good on everybody there. But you come back to it after, yes, yeah, six months after anything like that. What have we got? And uh, we've talked a little bit about this uh, in, in previous episodes, but it's an interesting phenomenon with these sort of open world games. And I feel like open world games are a certain uh, genre de jour of of AAA titles because again you put so many you know 90 hour work weeks onto hundreds of people working this is you make as big of a game as you can with the expectation that people are going to put a significant amount of their gaming time into it like the idea of you know people only will play what two games a year is this the expectation but that's not what the market asks for, and that's not what what we're doing. And all, all of this to kind of say that I, I think, yeah, um, there needs to be more, uh, I don't want to say like training moments or the ability to kind of get those systems back in, because it's not just knowing which button does the dodge roll. It's getting into enough of a combat situation or enough of a inventory situation where you remember, oh, this system layers on top of this one. Because there is usually the basics of movement and combat that you learn, then the quirks of how things string together and are that you learn, the sense of timing that you glean and gain from this you know, evolution of Dark Souls from software-style combat that a lot of places and... and uh, game experiences uh, develop from. There's not really... You can't really go back to an earlier level, like in a more Shovel Knighty or retro arcade kind of experience. That's already set there. But in a more open-world setting, yeah, where are... You know, even having an option that's just like training dojo or within the narrative. My wife is currently playing through Assassin's Creed Origins right now. This is her first foray into Assassin's Creed. She's actually really enjoying it quite a lot. And I've noticed that during loading screens, you kind of have the uh, the virtual reality 3D-ness loading. Yeah. And so you've got your your assassin, you got Bay standing in uh, in a loading area, and you can move around as him. And this was one of the things that really struck me how this is... We kind of get half degrees because yeah. everybody is now used to the idea of loading screen has helpful tips that yeah. you can scroll through that maybe you have enough time to read them and maybe they might be helpful. They're usually not. And getting to run around as him and like kind of try some stuff out, you get the feel for the controls, but you don't get the feel for interacting with the game and maybe surmounting the current challenges after a lapse. Yeah, I think it's interesting that we haven't, like, look, it's an age-old question, and I don't know that we've actually talked about it as a full-blown topic on the show, but we might want in the future, is, like, tutorials in gaming have a complex history, right? You know, mm -hmm. there's there are the folks who want a clear and present tutorial to be shown how to play the game, and there are others who want the tutorial folded into the gameplay. Something the Uncharted games have done very well is, like, the first stage is usually some kind of flashback or some kind of, like, memory or whatever and like you get to run through the controls and like mess around with stuff and so it feels like part of the narrative so it's not as obnoxious whereas like for example i'm playing the new paper mario as of when we we're recording this way back in the past from when you're actually hearing it um it just came out and nintendo is pretty keen on just here's the tutorial like here's the character telling you press this button like they don't really sugarcoat it which is fine too 
But all, all that said, most games also will allow you to turn off tooltips or tutorials, especially in MMOs, because you don't want to see them a thousand times. Um, but I, I, I would love some kind of like feature, especially in an open world game where you could have like a return to game tutorial, like you can turn off regular tutorials, but like some kind of feature you can t decide to turn on where if you return to the, like all of these consoles have internal clocks. Now they, when you save a game, it records the date and time you saved at, like maybe there's a setting where after three, six or months, nine months or a year, you can have this tutorial kick in where it's like, hi, we see you haven't played this game in a while. Here are the basics here's a training stage here's a quick mission run um i know for some people it would break the flow but that but giving the option to turn it off a would add accessibility which is something i yell about on this show constantly and something that the games industry doesn't do enough hard of. agree but also like for me like a perfect example again playing the new paper mario between game sessions we're talking hours maybe a day i forget which button is jump and which button is to use your hammer and it's not been that long since I've played the game. It's literally just I'm used to certain button layouts, and I don't think the button layouts are even bad. It's just I press the button. Oh, it's the hammer. That's not the jump button. This is the jump button. It's so, the problem of going between games, like this, right. this control scheme versus that one. And so for me, if I can forget controls over a couple of hours, I can, like, within three months, I don't have a shot in hell. Like, I've been loving the Yakuza 0 you know, I've never played the Yakuza series, and I'm currently playing Yakuza Zero along with some other stuff. And I, I'm loving the game. It's a lot of fun. The combat's wacky. The story is both dramatic and over the top. It's really great. It's a blast. Um, by the time this episode has aired, uh, we'll have had a side quest episode with the incredible Derek Van Dyke, who talked about Yakuza Zero and is actually the one who inspired me to play it. Um, so shout out to Derek. But that said, the controls are for combat can be complicated and I haven't played in a few days and I'm afraid if I go too long without playing this game, I'm just going to forget everything. The narrative I'm not worried about because it's one of those games where it handholds you for like, what's your next quest? What's your next mission? Like there's always a mini map waypoint. And so I'm not super worried about forgetting the narrative or the not remembering where my mission is. So from that perspective, I'm not that worried about jumping back into it even after time, but for sure with the combat, um, because in a devil may cry kind of way, like there's combos and there's different fighting styles. Um, I'm afraid that I'll just, all of that will fall out of my head if I go too long without playing it. And some kind of tutorial that's like, oh, you haven't played Yakuza 0 in six months. Here's the basic control layout. Here's a fight real quick. So you could get, get your, wrap your brain back around it. Here are the basic move sets. And then I would feel more comfortable like leaving games sitting longer and then going back to them if that kind of thing existed. And to my knowledge, there's no game that has that that I know of. Me neither. And I I would love to be proven wrong on that. Like same full stop. And you actually kind of bring up an interesting like dichotomous argument at the end there that the idea of if a triple A title has a system for getting back into the game like that, that allows you to lapse well, what incentive is it for them to put it in there? They want you to play the game and, and like be <laughs> on top true. of it. However, this kind of, the bottom falls out after a while because if enough games come out where you know that that's going to happen, you just, there comes a point where you'll just stop getting those games. Yeah. And and that is a general you that like you the listener we the the the, the talkers. Um, there comes a point where it's like it's just not worth getting. Like that's definitely a thing that gets in my way in starting long multi hour massive things where it's Same. that kind of thing of yeah it, it it takes a little while to kind of get the feel for it get the groove for it. You have that initial learning curve where it at whatever point gets its hooks in you and you're like yes okay i get this i'm loving this this is great and life happens and whatever else and that fear that thing of like yeah but do i have you know the the game sessions the free time ahead of me in the near future to get through all this and then that just means fewer people are buying the game because they know that it's all or nothing yeah, I mean, that that's one of the things that got me out of the Assassin's Creed series is that I would start like and I started playing Origins. It was on sale for like five bucks. So I picked it up and I started playing Origins. This was last month, a couple months ago. And 
I after a couple hours in, I was not really super into it, which was disappointing because I wanted to be because I I've heard great things. But also, I think part of it was like I could feel my attention waning, and I knew that if I dropped it for more than a month, I would never remember the controls. Because while I, the Assassin's Creed games aren't overly complicated, they are not simple either. It's not just hack and slash. And so, you know, I think that you know that is a big fear and and because i had had a falling out with the series previously i was already hesitant and like this doesn't count for games that i've played a thousand times like i can pick up and put down mass effect from now till the end of time i'm always in between playthroughs on mass effect constantly because i know the game so well that even if i don't remember where i left off i could probably pretty easily figure it out you know, same with like a game, a playthrough of Final Fantasy VII or Chrono Trigger, or like any game that I've played multiple times, this isn't a problem for. It's for games that I'm playing for the first time or even the second time and like I'm not hyper familiar with. Yeah, yeah. And there's, it doesn't matter how avid of a gamer one is or how much of your time you spend on it, there's always going to be a learning curve. There's always a new series. There's always a, like, yeah, you mentioned the Yakuza series and I haven't started playing that yet. And, your recommendation is like the sixth or seventh, and I'm eventually going to, I'm going to do it eventually. Like, but it, it yeah, it, it's the, there is that uh, worry of sunk cost, like sunk game cost. Uh, yeah, I absolutely have a, a ton of series, tons of games that it's like, yeah, I can, it doesn't matter where you drop me in. It's like, have you ever played that, uh, game there's a thing online and i will remember it eventually it's a game that drops you in google maps in like street view in a random place in the world and you can't look up where you are and the idea is to kind of like maneuver around and try to find like an airport or try to find a way to travel from there Huh. Which is it's it's very fun and a great way to like I need something to do. I don't know what's going on, like that mindless kind of fun. It's it's really kind of zen in a way. But there are those games that, yes, you can do that to me and I know exactly what's going on. You know, same for you, Matt. Like you could get dropped at any random point in Mass Effect. Someone could give you a controller and go, What's going on? You'll like it may take you a moment, but you'll figure it out. Yeah. That's not the norm. That's not like for a person that could be one game, that could be a hundred games. Drop in the bucket. Yeah. And so I guess the question becomes, what are some of the ways that AAA titles could implement this? Off the top of my head, I've been trying to rack my brain to figure out like an interesting dynamic like brake pad almost. Mm -hmm. Like whether that is putting on the 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 button prompts from the beginning of the game at a later point until you successfully do them a certain number of times and they're gone. You know, trying to make it so that it's not necessarily a uh, okay, now I need to turn on and turn off all of these options to make it happen or is it a like a dojo option or like all right, put me into a this kind of fight, a this kind of fight, let me get the feel for that again. I'm I'm not sure. I don't know that there's a clear answer. I think it also depends on the type of game. Um, you know, it, it it's it depends on how much immersion matters. It depends on what you're coming to this game for. Like, I can't imagine the FromSoft Dark Souls series doing anything like this, mostly because that like that that's been a big conflict is the accessibility of those games. And so I like. You know, the idea is it's supposed to be difficult. So if you forgot the controls from the mindset of what I hear of the folks who play those games, like tough, tough, figure it out. Yeah, like, get good. You know, um, which is fine. Um, I think for me, again, I think an, an optional tutorial that you can turn on and off. I don't know quite how that would shape because I like narrative catch up is fine. I feel like if it's a game I've played or a story I'm familiar with, even if I haven't finished it in a while i can probably figure out where i left off or what was going on um i find that that narrative information is easier to retain for me than mechanical information um part of it also is the length of games and i think this is a separate conversation but like i don't know that AAA titles need to be 100 hours anymore and like you were talking about like series that we drop out of 
Um, I, I have, I think this series that I wanted to like is cursed, but the Xenoblade Chronicle series, I bought the second game first because it was on the Switch before the first game was. I tried playing it, couldn't get very far, fell out of it. And when I went back to it, I had no idea what I was doing. So I never, I never finished it. And maybe I will at some point. With the newest one, uh, I played it longer. Uh, the, by the newest one, I mean the first one was re-released on the Switch, the definitive edition. And I loved what I played of it. Um, but then some other thing took my attention and I haven't touched it. I feel like that one might be easier for me to jump back into because the, the combat is pretty straightforward and the narrative is fairly close to on rails, even though it's open world and you can do side quests. Um, but like I, I haven't touched it in weeks. And now that I'm playing Paper Mario and Yakuza and I might restart the Halo franchise because I like making things harder for myself. Um, <laughs> I don't know that I'll ever go back to it. And I'm starting to wonder, is it just that I don't like that series? I had fun with the game while I was playing it. So I don't know. I think I think the problem is our attention spans are shorter to a degree. Our time is limited. And there are more games than we could ever play in our lifetime that exist currently and more are still coming out. And on top of that, like I've had people ask me when, when I started side quests, are you afraid of running out of games? You know, you're releasing them three times every two weeks and yeah. you're not letting people pick the same game more than once. Are you afraid you're going to run out? And the simple answer is no. I could probably air the show every day for the rest of our lives without using the same game twice. And I'm sure I wouldn't run out of games, especially since folks are picking indie titles, folks are picking AAA titles, folks are picking modern games, retro games. Like, it, it, it would be impo just like it's impossible to listen to all the music in the world in your lifetime or watch all the TV. It's the same thing with video games. And as I get older, I feel this pressure, especially as my time is limited and I'm working on other things and I'm doing other stuff, like the pressure to play a game that I really love and to not waste my time with stuff that doesn't hold my interest becomes more imperative. And I mean, streaming has shifted that a bit because I can revisit games that I never played on stream. And if I don't like them, I can move on. But if I do, I have a scheduled event with this game to see it through to the end. Um, but beyond that, it's like, I, I don't know that I feel this pressure to have to finish everything I play if I don't like it because our time is limited and there are too many games. Yeah, there too many games. <laughs> like what what a glor what a glorious problem but yeah it, it this definitely calls into question our games unnecessarily padded and there is a definite and we've kind of touched on it a little before the idea that bigger budget titles there is that expectation it's kind of i feel like you know we're harping on open world titles a lot right now but it is kind of this is where a lot of the big games are right now and a lot of this issue we're talking about is prevalent it's kind of the it's it's currently in the phase that ps1 jrpgs were mm -hmm. where it was like the amount of time you could put into this is, is a selling point where yeah like uh you know Z xeno gears from which xenoblade <laughs> is is sort of derived sort of. uh you know 80 hour game you know the final fantasy is all like i uh, you know i'm and cool, great. That was also the time when the shortness of a game was was a strike against it. I infamously remember the Ico review that was done on Toonami where they were like, oh, it's only a five-hour game. And is it really that good of a game? Yes. Yes, yes. it is. Yes. Shut up. It is. It's great. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, like you can still have an open-world game and an open-world experience that's 20 hours that's and i really want to see what that is and where that goes because you can still have an epic quest with side quests and everything else and it not be a job and it not be something that yeah if you leave it you you don't remember what you're doing that's i mean that 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 creates that kind of apathy that creates that yeah you you want people to Put a ton of hours into your game and to be to be getting it as soon as it comes out be part of that conversation about it and the social media campaigns but also if you are able to release games that are a little shorter um people might feel greater goodwill more people will finish the game and get that complete experience you know now now matt you can't really speak to the complete xenoblade experience because you kind of fell out of it. Maybe you'll come back to it. Maybe not. But if you were able to 
whatever the experience is, if it was only as long as it needed to be, you can then be part of the 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 stands cheering for it. You know, it, it's uh, easy to forget how short of a game Chrono Trigger is. Yeah, and and a lot of retro games. Yeah, and now granted, menu driven uh, RPGs, it's both harder and easier to get back into them after a lapse yeah. because it's a little less reaction time. So you're able to be like, you come to a boss, you come to a thing, you go, okay, what does that ability do? What is this thing? Uh, hold on, let me get my phone. And, you know, you look it yeah. up and that's fine. So for more menu-driven titles, less reaction-based, you're able to ease yourself back in better and still can in more retro-flavored titles that allow for the arcade experience to go back and try to try something again or, or go back to an old level. There you go. You can go back to an old level, and if it's well-designed, it teaches you as you play. And so you can kind of go back to those, you know, it's if Uncharted lets you have that flashback whenever you want it. Right. Um, it, it's the old, like, cutscene demo theater idea where, you know what, that's probably not a bad idea narrative-wise, being able to kind of see what were the choices I made. What, like, let me let me play back these conversations. I, I don't know what that would mean for, like, storage, RAM, access, whatever, but I feel like the stuff's all still there and giving you access to, all right, how did I treat them the last time I talked to them? What was the thing I agreed to? That that's that's also useful because that will inform not just your narrative choices but your gameplay choices as well. And I don't know if I have a point with this. <laughs> I'm just like, well, th- this this is frustrating. Well, yeah, I think uh, t- on the topic of shorter games, I think we have to eventually hit a saturation point, like with graphics, of like, can we make games any longer? Why don't we make them shorter? Because also part of it is, I think besides this kind of tutorial forced into a game to help you remember shorter games are also a solution to this like i recently played journey for the first time and i had never played it and you can bang that game out in an hour and a half to two hours and it's a phenomenal experience that i will play at least once once a year if not more for the rest of my life because it's so short it's incredible and and it's such a massively gorgeous and stunning game and like the same way like i've Play, replayed uh, Untitled Goose Game three or four times because it's a three-hour experience, maybe five hours if you take your time. And I think a solution to this, the dredge of getting lost in a game and having to force yourself to revisit is these shorter games that you can get through in a chunk or two, then you won't have to worry about revisiting. And like, I think we're past the point of our money's worth. Like, I think if I had to pay $60 for a three-hour game, I might be a little upset. But the game landscape because of digital download and other things is so different now that like I would pay 30 to $40 for a shorter experience that I knew I could make it through that I would enjoy as much. I don't need to pay 60 or $70 for a game and then sit with it for a hundred hours. Like if I'm not playing anything else, um, you know, the rare title that really soaks me in, like Ma- the Mass Effect trilogy or like the new Spider-Man on PS4 games that really pull me in, then I'm happy to play them for 60 to 80 hours, whatever it is. Or like the new Fire Emblem, which I loved. Like if the game really hooks me, I don't care about the length. But the problem is the 90% of the games I play, I'm going to like but not love. And that could go either way. Yeah, there, there's always going to be those marathon titles that are going to get their diehard fans like yeah i i'm sure just about every game in existence has at least one diehard fan uh source unknown but (laughs) on that but what about the other 90 percent, 95 percent, whatever it is of people who play the game and like it and but you still have to it feels like there's more to surmount. And if you don't love the title, you're f- going to forgive it less. Um, actually, yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten about Spider-Man as an interesting example of a game in terms of getting you back into it if you haven't played it in a little while. Because there is such a distinct way of traversing the world within it. And it's 
it can be annoying if you are like marathoning the title to have to like constantly stop muggers and like every like police blotter that comes up like you you feel like I just want I just want to keep going like what's going on but if you come back into the title and you haven't played in a while those are smaller encapsulated experiences that you are able to go stop fight, utilize. Oh, I, oh, there's a backpack nearby for me to find. Oh, there's another questy thing to do. Oh, I need to go stop, you know, whomever it is on the list right now. It's not a perfect system, but it actually in doing so uh, gives you a little bit of it does kind of ease you back into it a little by giving you the 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 minor interactions, the minor encounters to then like, oh, right, this is how I do things. Like th- those are the sorts of things that, yeah, bigger titles we almost want again. Like ha- having a minor encounter in The Witcher where you can be like, oh, right, this is how I deal with this guy. This is how I activate this. Right, right, right. Cool. Good to go. Good to go. All right. Back on the horse. Sure. I think I think also it comes back to accessibility. Like I wish games weren't afraid to have an easy difficulty. Like, I get it. I get that you want challenge and that some people play video games for a challenge. And I totally get that. And sometimes I do too. Certain games, like the the Curse of the Moon series, which there are new t- currently two titles in now, which is part of the Bloodstained franchise, which is a franchise already, I guess, at this point. Um, yeah, right. Those are challenging, but you die and come back so fast and the cycle of it happens so fast that you can jump back into it. Um, and I don't mind that kind of difficulty. But for something like The Witcher, if I play it on easy and I don't remember the controls, at least I can fumble around. I might die. I might get really hurt. But otherwise, I can kind of fumble my way through combat as I remember because I'm not going to die instantly, whereas I might on a harder difficulty. Same with a, a first person shooter that allows you to play on easy with no real penalty. Um, it allows you to kind of fumble your way through as you're remembering the controls. And so while that's not an active tutorial as far as how to remember how to play the game, it at least gives you leeway. Games that are unforgiving have their place and their fans. Uh, that not happens to not be my style, but they also don't give you much leeway in returning to the game after being away for a while. Because if the difficulty's ramped up from minute one, you can't reteach yourself. Yeah. I mean, well, or, let me rephrase that. I can't reteach myself. Some people might. Some people may thrive under pressure, and that's the way they need to relearn the controls, and that's fine. But for me personally, that kind of pressure doesn't make it easier. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's important to figure out other ways to be inclusive. And I think having an easy difficulty or changing it, calling it casual and hardcore, whatever you want to call it, whatever namesake works for you. Um, I, I, I think that, and we've talked about this, we did a whole episode on difficulty settings, like, you know, I, I think they have their place. Some people don't agree. And it's been a big capital D discourse, especially with the FromSoft stuff. Um, but yeah. it comes down to accessibility for those who just don't have the skill level due to a physical impairment, um, a psychological impairment, any kind of anything that might make it harder for you to interact with the game. If you don't have that ease of access, it makes you hard to get into it. And I, I know for me as a fact, just having trouble remembering things as well as I should, that is a wall for me to jump back into games. And I think adding a level of accessibility that adds extra tutorial in one form or another or lower difficulty or whatever it is will only make people want to play these games more. I don't think less. Like, I am mad that I can't play Sekiro, but I'm not going to spend $70 or $60 on a game that I'm going to get an hour into and then get frustrated with and never play again. And like, I know that for a fact because I've played Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2 with friends, which makes it a little easier. And I've enjoyed that um, in the multiplayer, but the single player, like I get destroyed and then I just don't want to play the game anymore. And I I just wish that uh, some games, I'm on my high horse again. I just wish some games would have more levels of accessibility in allowing you to re-enter and re-engage. And I think that we're we're leaving, you know, game companies leaving money on the table by not um, coming up with ways to better engage with the person who steps away from their game. Yeah. And I will, in some games' favor nowadays, say that something really nice when it is implemented is the ability to change the difficulty of your experience on the fly. Yes. The fact that, you know, old days, you picked a difficulty, you are locked in. Now you can 
change it from the pause menu. Now, sometimes you, it's every time you start the game back up. Uh, uh, I am a big fan of Vanillaware games. I don't know if I've talked much about that on this show. I haven't played tons and tons of them, but the ones that I have played, I freaking love. And it's it's just the right kind of arcade action RPG. Like it it warms my heart. And one of my favorites uh, is Miramasa Rebirth for the Vita. And something about that game is there are it's not so much easy and hard. Oh God, I'm trying to remember what the name of it. Uh, uh, how they how they name it. It's actually been a little while since I've played. And I remember the hard version is called Chaos because there is a parrying mechanic within the game and there is either hold the button and you will auto parry and it's still a very challenging game and a very rewarding game on top of it or you gotta time it (laughs) and that's chaos it's you have to hit the slash guard button when they're hitting it's very dark souls on that and every time you start the game it's like you know you start it back up okay let me reload my file which way do you want to do it how do you want to do it this time yeah. And maybe being able to change that on the fly, I haven't looked into that. I've I've always held the guard button. I'm a pleb, whatever. <laughs> you know, come at me. And I just love the game. I, I like the swords. But being able to do that and the fact that, yeah, it, it feels much more normalized these days to if the game isn't dynamically adjusting its difficulty, you can. And given that that's already implemented in games, probably a, a, a haphazard... Uh, outsider solution i suppose that is occurring to me is even being able to put in like a timed difficulty curve like you yeah. come back to a game like yeah you're right the the internal clock on a system knows how long it's been and be like hey do you want to whatever you want to call it but for like the next hour the next whatever amount of play time uh the the dodge window is a little bigger the like all of those things are a little more forgiving and then the timer goes, you know, it either very dynamically narrows or like after a certain point, it's like, hey, it's going to be back to normal. I hope you're comfortable again. Or you can, you know, you set the timing when you come back. Do you want five minutes of it? Do you want it for a while? Or do you just want to play on an easier difficulty for a while? It's it's another one of those things where, Matt, I'm very much in your corner on accessibility is kind of is on the should be on the ruling council of games and fun and playing and those the the facts that there are these little measures of okay are you getting creamed right now and that's not fun for you you can play it a little easier you can turn these things on i like that not every game does it i don't know if every game needs to do it but i'm a big fan of it and maybe that is the starting point for figuring out how to ease people back into an experience they love. Because even if you love a great challenge in a game, there is a great sense of accomplishment and reward in learning the system and getting good at that system. Speaking as a musician, if it's been a while since I've played an instrument, it's not as if I suddenly have to play the hardest thing I could play the last time I played this time. You warm up. You warm yeah. up every day. You play scales. You do the you 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 play pieces you enjoy. You you do all kinds of things to to build and be and to expect that in a leisure activity because games are leisure, damn it. Um yes. is if if it's cruel. Yeah. And I I think and that you remind me so um it's no secret to anybody on this podcast, but uh, Jeff and I love side-scrolling action platformers. Um, as of when we're recording, they recently released Curse of the Moon 2, which is a sequel to one of my favorite games of the most recent years. And Curse of the Moon 2 takes something that you're talking about and steps it up a notch. So Curse of the Moon 1 had casual and normal. Casual, you had unlimited lives. Um, and uh, I think... Oh, and you no knockback, and you didn't get knocked back when you were hit, which are things that were made the original Castlevania very hard. And then you know, and and the normal mode had those things. You had limited lives, and you would get knocked back when you got hit. In the original game, you could only turn it on at the start of a playthrough, and that was it. You were locked in, I believe, for that playthrough. In the new game, you can choose every time you start up the game, every save file. It's not locked in. 
You could do that in the first one as you well. You could do that you in could, the first one, okay. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, between casual or veteran. Right. And, I, it, and at least they had the the stance of like, okay, veteran difficulty, it's not like filthy casual. It's more of, okay, yeah, I know we're cribbing Castlevania 3 super hard. Do you do you want it to feel exactly like it? Right. Like this. But as we've talked about, there's a lot of stuff that we put up with in decades past that nowadays – you know, with limited time, with, you know, the, the the language of game development changing, we wouldn't put up with this shit anymore. Yeah. So, you know, so, yeah, being able to every time you start it up, like, you know what? I just I'm sick of these things knocking me off the platform. Casual, whatever. Yeah. I'm having fun. Yeah. And I think that those are a step in the right direction to the kind of thing we're talking about today to make uh, engaging with a game that you've been away from for a while. Now, like I've been playing Curse of the Moon 2 on casual already. So when I go back to it, I will continue what I'm doing. But that said, it's still at least it gives me the option of engaging on a simpler difficulty to some def- uh, level or another to get back into it and make my way through it. I think that, you know, ideally, yes, a full-blown tutorial after being away from a game for a long time would be great with the option to turn it off. All tutorials should be able to be turned off um, because, like, if you're playing a game for the hundredth time, I don't need to be reminded how to shoot a gun in a game I've played a thousand times. I'm pushing the button. Why aren't you letting me do it? Yeah. And so, you know, that kind of thing, I think, is excessive. And so I understand wanting to turn that off. But I think that at the end of the day, if we can find some way, and again, neither me or Jeff are game developers. So I'm sure there are a lot of things in the way of doing something like this. But I feel like something tied to the eternal clock and like just something that allows you to relive the game mechanics in a brief way to re-engage even if it's like a training mission, like the VR missions in Metal Gear Solid or something like that, like yeah. allowing you to jump back into something without playing the progress of the game and possibly screwing that up to refresh yourself before you jump in. Um, I know that fighting games have that, have always had that a kind of training mode or practice mode where you can just beat up on a computer opponent that doesn't move to refresh how to use the moves. Something like that, but for other games, that's not just a separate menu option that's more integrated, I think would be really great for re-engaging with the longer games that we step away from. Because at the end of the day, I will always choose a shorter or more linear game over a giant open world game unless it's something I really, really want to play because of that fear of putting it down and never picking it up again. And it's a little illogical in the long run. It's a game, right? It's a leisure activity. I'm not, I'm not, no one's going to get hurt if I never play it again. But, you know, I, I Anxieties don't have to be logical, and I think anything to surmount those difficulties to engage with games, um, you know, it's why I've been really obsessed with narrative-driven games lately, because there's less mechanics. Like, I just finished Night in the Woods not that long ago, which was absolutely phenomenal, and I hadn't played. Um, Shout out to Abu from Lore Party, who kept raving about that game, and I finally played it. Um, That was mostly narrative. And so, like, even going a week without playing it or two weeks without playing it, when I got back into it, it was just navigating the story. And it was really engaging and really fun. And I tend to like those experiences a lot lately because there's less to worry about remembering other than the story itself, which I've already stated, I am better at retaining than mechanics. Yeah, and if a game is a little shorter, the the thing is, you... I mean, you're more likely to replay a title if you played it the whole way through and you enjoyed it, whether it was a 20 minute game or a 20 hour game. And if you've played a full playthrough and you're like, I'm going to start a new playthrough. If you're doing it immediately after, like you just finished it, you want to start again. Cool. Play it on the higher difficulty. Try a bigger challenge. Did you beat Curse of the Moon on casual? Beat it on veteran now, whatever it is. You know, no one's telling you to, but you're like, yeah, I'm really enjoying the challenge but if you're coming back to it after whatever x length of time if you're like i want to start that experience again like i know there's passwords in mega man x but i usually just sit and play through the game and yeah it gets tricky it gets difficult but if i'm starting on the highway stage every time then it's all like i'm already going through the the integrated tutorial again and so uh, yeah that's an argument in favor of a shorter, more encapsulated, I don't know, deeper vertical slice of, of gameplay, it, it means you can get interesting, you can get complicated, and some accessibility uh, issues taken into account, you know, everyone start from the same spot again because you're going at it in a new way, but you're all starting from the same spot. It's, 
Uh, it's something I like considering. And yeah, as as Matt said, we are not game developers. We are we are not even experts. Um, we're experts in something, but it's definitely not this. And this is just to to get the ball rolling. Like we want to know what everyone thinks about this. For sure. Yeah, I think you know the big thing for me also is. Every experience is different. And if you're playing through a mm-hmm. game thinking about, I can't wait to beat it or I can't wait to get to the end, then that's a problem with the greater game or your connection to it. And I think no amount of tutorial to come back to it later is going to help. If all you can think about is completing the game and moving on to the next thing, you're probably a games journalist or you're someone who is not really into that game. And so I think that, you know, at the end of the day, Anything that allows us to revisit stuff that we've been away from would like I have a ton of games on my switch alone that I have not finished and I have not completed. I've not even beaten and on my Steam library as well, as we've talked about before, if there were a way to help me train to jump back into something I haven't played in months and months and months, I'd be more inclined to revisit a game where I left off and play it through to the end, even if I only sort of liked it or didn't love it, to finish the experience and see what was trying to be offered. Maybe it'll change my mind, you know, but I'm never, Red Dead Redemption 2 is available on Xbox Game Pass, which I have on the PC. I could play it. And you've heard my complaints on the podcast. I didn't want to support it monetarily because of the way the developers were treated. That said, I could play this game now and not pay anything extra because I already paid for Game Pass. It's not costing me anything extra. No money's going to the development to the to the to Rockstar. But the reality is it's a hundred hour game and I have no desire, no matter how good the game is, to play a game for a hundred hours. Cause I don't even with more time right now that I have than I've ever had before for games, I still don't want to spend that much time playing one game. I'd rather play four 20-hour games or two 40-hour games than play one 80 to 100-hour game. Yeah, and I know that there is, like, you know, you need to have that initial sales push as far as a game goes when it comes out. Like, that's where most of the sales will probably happen, but if a game is one that you can come back to later and enjoy it, we're no longer in the days where you get a a monthly gaming magazine and you read the reviews and you base it off that. We have the internet. We have social media. We have uh, people becoming champions for titles long after release. It's one of the reasons why I've been so excited about uh, about side quests because it's it allows all of us to talk about games as recent as yesterday or as old as before we were born. And I, I I know, Matt, you've been finding new games through it. I've been finding new games through it. People's recommendations, you know, Night in the Woods, it, it came out a couple years ago, but it's still, I'm still happy to give it sales. I'm still happy to give it time. I'm still happy to talk about it yeah. because it's one that just as much of a, hey, it's not going to take too long to play through this game. It's super worth it. You're going to really enjoy the experience. Those are those are the important recommendations. Those are the important things. You know, it's big, it's important, it's new. Uh, it's lock, but <laughs> I, I, sorry, it's where my brain went. And it it becomes tricky. And yeah, this does become a push and pull of at what point do you justify the cost of a game? At what point? I mean, and there's talk of of game prices going up to seventy dollars in the next generation, and there's arguments about inflation and not and change and whatever else. But if it's like, well, we need to raise the price to justify all of the teams that are going into making these multi-hour games that we're now not even wanting to get into because we know we're not going to be able to get back into them. That is, well, then we're, we're not really justifying these longer games and these higher prices. If it gets harder and harder to recommend them, there, yeah, there's there's a uh, there's a saturation point, there's a tipping point, and I don't know if we're at it culturally, but I, I, it sounds like Matt that you and I kind of are. Yeah, and I think we've also discussed briefly in this episode, but like splash screens with controller layouts and scrolling tips on the bottom of the screen are not refreshers. They don't help. No, they, they are not. They've never helped, and they don't help. 
I, I don't know anyone who can retain information better because of those. And if you are someone, please tell me. But like I, in my experience, I, like I get why you do it. It gives the player something to sort of engage with but during loading screens and stuff. But like as consoles get better, computers get better and loading times get shorter, they those matter less. And like I can't look at a full map of keys and go, all right, so that's there. And that like, I need to learn through the experience. Reading how to play something, like in the old instruction manual days, wouldn't work for me now, even though I right. loved doing it as a kid. And an old instruction manual, you can at least keep in your lap or keep nearby. So if you're like, wait, how do I do this? You can look at it. There it is, I, which I suppose you can look up on your phone. But man, if only there was a way in these interactive mediums for you to like more <laughs> deeply learn something like i don't know through doing it <laughs> yeah, yeah it's 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 astonishing how some games still think it's okay to flash across the screen now it's different if you're playing something like mario party and there are like a couple buttons you need to know for that one mini game and it shows it mm -hmm. on the screen that makes sense yeah but like if we're talking like a, it, yeah a quick experience Yes, but if we're talking Assassin's Creed Origins and you it, it's showing you how to do a combo while also jumping off a ledge, while also free diving, while also investigating and how to search for stuff, like it's it's too much. And through doing is always going to be better. And I think at the end of the day, if we can come up with some kind of return to game tutorial system for gaming that will allow us to better engage when we've been away, I think it will only improve gaming experiences across the board. I can't imagine. Agreed. I mean, there'll always be the loudest, most annoying people who will say, you know, this sucks for this reason and I have no real reason. And that's fine. They exist. They're out there. But like for the most part, I think it would be to the benefit of the gaming community to help us re-engage with things we've been away from for a long time. Right. And to be fair, some games that do that, it's like the button prompt appears right over your character. So you're already looking at it or it's a more dynamic thing rather than just uh, here's the buttons. Cool. We can still even do better on that just because something is doing OK. We can still do better. And we'd like to hear your take on this, listeners. What are there games that we don't know about that really do a great job of reintegrating through uh, after a lapse? Because, again, we haven't played every game and never will. And that's where we all come in, helping each other out. Uh, where do you think games can better utilize and integrate a tutorial or not? Are there games that had a great example of a tutorial that you wish was more prevalent in a, in a style of game? Where Where is it good? Where is it bad? Where do you think it is? We'd like to hear from you about it. Yeah. Um, as always, you can follow us on Twitter, Fun and Games Pod. You can email us. You can get all of our contact info from the internet uh, at large. But we're Fun and Games Pod wherever it matters. Um, please reach out. You can also join our Discord server. Um, if you go to certainpov.com, which is our incredible podcast network, um, we have a permanent invite link to the Discord server. Um, we have questions of the day uh, Jeff, that Jeff posts every day asking about things in gaming that we can chat about and engage with. You know, we have a gaming log where people are posting games they're starting, games they've completed accomplishments they've made. We want to have a conversation about this stuff. And if uh, social media overwhelms you, and I get it because it overwhelms yes. me too, um, please join our Discord because it's way more intimate. Um, it's a lot a lot more personal. The conversations are much easier to engage in. It's less overwhelming. And we'd just love to have you. Um, as always, um, thanks for listening. Rate like, subscribe, review, all of that stuff helps us to grow this community because at the end of the day, this is a community and we want to hear from you. Absolutely. And if you want to do more than just uh, talk with us on Discord or engage with us on Twitter, be sure to check out SideQuests, which has been going strong and continues to go strong. If you've got a game you feel passionately about, and want to talk about, get in contact with us. And we've got a database of games, and hey, if no one else has claimed it, maybe you can, because we like to hear from all of you however we can. This is a conversation. Thank you for being a part of it. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I am at AK Storm again. And happy gaming. Hey there, Screen Beans. Have you heard about Screen Snark? Rachel, this is an ad break. They aren't screen beans until they listen to the show. Fine. Potential screen beans. You like movies and TV shows, right? I mean, who doesn't? 
Screen Snark is a casual conversation about the movies and television shows that are shaping us as we live our everyday lives. That's right, Matt. We have a chat with at least one incredible guest every episode, hailing from all walks. We've interviewed chefs, writers, costumers, musicians, yoga teachers, comedians, burlesque dancers, folks in the film and TV industry, and more. We'd be delighted for you to join us every other Monday on the Certain POV Podcast Network. Or wherever you get your podcasts fresh and tasty off the presses. What? what? That's... No, that's not... Can I call them screen beans now? Fine. Screen beans! So tune in and we'll see you at the movies or on a couch somewhere. Because you're a whole screen beans now. You will be mine. Aurora! CPOV. CertainPOV.com.